Welcome to Classical Chats, I'm Tiffany. Today we have Gabby Fields. She is a piano amateur, but also she is a PhD student currently doing a history program in the University of Exeter, University of Reading, and in collaboration with Historic Royal Palaces, she's currently researching on Queen Victoria. I'm very excited to talk to her because Queen Victoria had a lot of exchanges and interactions with romantic composers like Clara Schumann, Mendelssohn, Greek, Berlioz, and so I'm interested to kind of hear about her research and what she's learned about Queen Victoria. And if you enjoyed this chat, please consider donating to Together with Classical. We're currently trying to fundraise $10,000 for the second iteration of Together with Classical grants to help support people's passion for classical music. And you can be an amateur or professional just as long as you have the financial need and the passion for classical music. We would love to be able to help you fund your instruments, your lessons, or your musical projects. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Very nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. I'm very... I'm very excited to hear from you because, um, as you mentioned, I've been getting into the heads of composers, trying to understand a little bit of the historical context of music, and it's wonderful that you're kind of doing something similar, but in the other, from the other side, you're not really trying to understand the music, but you're trying to understand the person, yeah, which to me, it's, it's kind of related. I'm trying to understand a person to understand the music. Yeah. And for you, you're trying to understand Queen Victoria. So I'm excited to hear um, how this came to be and where this all started. But before I talk about all of the nerdy things that I'm excited about, um, let's start with the very first question that I ask every single guest, which is how did your journey with classical music begin? How did you get interested? Well, it was sort of... I don't know, as a child, I learned piano and then gave up. It wasn't it wasn't for me at the time and I didn't enjoy it. And then I came back to piano when I was maybe 15 or 16. And then I was only doing like one handed melodies of like film soundtracks or whatever. And then by the time I got to university, I started listening to like Beethoven. I'm not really sure how that happened, if it just accidentally came up on YouTube autoplay or something. And I was like, oh, this is this is good. I should. I should really like I should focus on this and I bought a keyboard took it to university and that's when I really started listening to classical music and playing classical music albeit not very well but it now makes up a, a good 90% of my free time listening to classical music oh, wow but yeah it's it's really that's great fantastic and I love it so it really so, just completely changed um because you weren't really interested before but somehow um uh, you got back into it yeah, um, that's cool. How's um yeah. how's Beethoven Sonata going? I think you you mentioned you were starting the twentieth. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Beethoven, was, so I hear the easiest sonata, but it's it's so much fun. I love it. It's such a like, is it a the fun easiest? I don't know. I don't know. Is it the G major one? Yeah. Ah, it's cute. I like it. It's very cute. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm loving it. That's so fun. So how did you decide to? pick um, Queen Victoria and this topic of trying to understand her love for music. How did that uh, kind of, maybe it's related to, I guess, your return to classical music? I'm not sure. Well, the PhD is actually about Queen Victoria's like political agency and her self-curation through the books that she read throughout her very long life. And to get into that, because I only started this PhD a few weeks ago or like in the last month, I've been reading through her diaries and mm -hmm. there are volumes and volumes and volumes of these diaries all digitized online. Uh, and I've just been reading through them to get more of an idea of what her thoughts were, although they are heavily edited, but still the best things we have. So she often talks about music. I mean, like a lot talks about music very, very much from being an like early teenager all the way through to like her last entries. She always talks about music and how much she loves it and I love music too so I thought it would be a really interesting and useful way to sort of get into understanding her a bit more and yeah this is this is kind of what I've been doing. So the question I had when you first talked about how you've been going through the digitalized uh, diaries is uh, how do you feel about reading someone else's diaries because I always feel a little bad 
about invading someone else's privacy. Although maybe you got a sense from reading her entries how maybe she knew that there would be a public audience. I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, so especially with Queen Victoria, her diaries initially started as a way for her mother to keep like tabs on her behavior and that sort of thing. So she always knew they were going to be read at least by a member of her family uh, and her governess or anyone who needed to basically they weren't private uh and ah then, that's interesting yeah so the huh. ones that are online now as i said were heavily edited by her daughter her youngest daughter who oh. edited them to an extent i'm not quite sure but quite a, quite a large extent if it is edited and she destroyed the originals which is you know ah. not fantastic so yeah I think at but that that's point, interesting yeah at that point it was assumed i i hope that it was going to be made more accessible if not publicly then a little bit more like scholarly or academic but they were made accessible fairly recently to the public um yeah not Ah. i don't think i I, i'm not sure she ever considered them as particularly private yeah maybe not because i also it reminds me of uh clara schumann and with robert schumann's uh earlier letters there's a collection that clara herself edited and published as a way to preserve her husband's memory and reputation and um, i think a lot of people had not so good ones about him after his death and because he was known to be in an asylum and basically kind of like a crazy man maybe that was kind of what prompted her to uh, think about his public image and try to preserve that through publications of their um, exchanges and their letters so maybe it's similar um, but that's interesting so what's something that you or a few things that you learned about her thoughts on music oh she has so many so many thoughts um so I was looking initially at like her her younger years of going to the opera literally every single night to see her favorite opera stars uh, who she had like this, these huge teenage crushes on um particularly uh Luigi LaBlanche um who became her her singing teacher sorry I've got some I've got I printed off some entries that I thought would be oh yeah that would be wonderful (laughs) yeah where are they here they are uh so yeah and also the opera singer Giulia Grissi who was uh, an Italian opera singer who Victoria loved like no one else I mean she was obsessed with her went to see her every single night was talking about how beautiful she was and how exquisitely she sung um (laughs) and on her 16th birthday Victoria's mother organized her to come and sing privately with uh, a few others um and she describes in her diaries how uh Julia's face and neck is so beautiful and she has lovely eyelashes and a fine nose and a sweet mouth um as she had She's describing her dress um, and what her hair was like and how it was in a plait. And then to the other two who she's, who were saying, she describes them like with one sentence each, like, oh, they're a bit short and ugly. I didn't really, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, she was So she really, focused really a lot. She focused a lot on the appearance, I guess, when yeah. she was young uh, and kind of the glamour side of things. Yeah, definitely. There was a, a lot. I think she thought that was like, I mean, opera is obviously very glamorous, but that was really the most aspirational kind of glamour. And, you know, she talks about how how she likes to dress up, like how uh, how the um, opera singers do. And yeah, it's it's quite sweet because, I mean, I'm I'm not too far off having my own like teenage obsessions. So (laughs) looking back and I I can see a lot of that and thinking, yeah, I can write perhaps not to opera singers, but yeah yeah Quite that's funny. that's really endearing to hear about that that did she play any music herself any instruments did she sing she sang and she played piano so i i don't know how good she was at p- playing piano but i know that she did a lot of um piano duets i mean she had to be obviously proficient enough to be able to play like rigid symphonies that were reduced for two two ha- four hands even two people four hands um which she played with albert probably most evenings of their like entertainment and also with her children um and she did sing as well and Mendelssohn described her as you know very like the best amateur he'd ever heard oh 
that's, so they were quite good very... friends I, I assume he had to be quite flattering uh, <laughs> yeah I mean I guess when you're queen the queen I guess no one would really say you suck you know yeah <laughs> so <laughs> <You don't> know. <laughs> But I'm curious, uh, I don't know how far along your research has been so far, so um, maybe you haven't gotten to those parts yet, but so you know about her teenage obsessions with the opera singers and the, I guess, more of the glamorous aspect of it. Were there more, as she grew up, more commentaries on arts and music in society? Um, From the diaries, it's all very like personal and how she individually feels about things. Uh, I'm sure there's like a lot more out there about what she did in a more like societal capacity but with the diaries it's very more like how like intimately she felt music and whenever she heard a piece of music how she'd like just describe it as like the most beautiful thing she'd ever heard. What were some of her um, favorite pieces or composers that she mentions? Her, I'd say her favorite composer at least for like she she went through phases as as we all do indeed but uh. for her young life she was she adored mendelssohn um as as a friend and also as a composer and um i i think he adored her too in 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 a letter that he wrote um where he recounts dedicating a symphony to her which is um his scottish symphony uh. which i would yeah recommend um and um yeah, with Mendelssohn, she describes him as, you know, the most beautiful composer, this like exquisite mind. So, yeah, he she describes him as, um, as an agreeable and clever man, and his countenance beams with intelligence and genius. Um, and she was also very appreciative of how he used to arrange his songs without words for uh, as a duet, so she could play them with her husband Albert. Ah. Um, yeah, so Mendelssohn was a very big one. And then in her later life, I think Wagner, I would say, is probably her, one of her favourites. This was like in the late, early or late 1890s um, for her 80th birthday when there was this private performance of Lohengrin. Um, and that's like, you never, you never hear Victoria be just as moved as she was when she heard that. So that was oh. an interesting one. I don't know Wagner very well, but you know, she, I don't she's... either. Usually, <laughs> usually I hear usually I hear criticisms of Wagner and his yeah, me too. Uh, operas, among many other things. I had no idea that she had. Uh, I mean, I'm not surprised because I know that back then um, there were music and the salon was a huge part of the culture to be the entertainment and also to have discussions about art and music around that kind of um yeah that kind of circle i i kind of understand it but i never really um thought much about queen victoria to be honest but also yeah it's interesting that kind of understanding how she views music or maybe her interactions with music through her more private um well not super private since her mother apparently reads the diary entries but still a little bit uh, more private kind of how that gives her more human more emotions and a bit more aspects to her public persona i guess yeah uh and something that is good fun to read is just all of the composers that she meets because she's got she's obviously living at the same time as pretty much all of the great romantic composers and she meets them you know semi-regularly i would say so just as as a list of some of the ones i've read in the diary she she met um or she saw a performance performance conducted by Berlioz she met Czerny, Grieg, Liszt, Mendelssohn, Paganini, Sansons, Clara Schumann, uh, Wagner, Sarasate and these are all they all like came and performed for her so she really like she's really uh, like attuned to the musical climate I suppose uh she loves like the new musical content basically um mm-hmm. and she yeah, she describes all. She describes all of them as like, you know, amazing, and she loves them all except for Berlioz. She did not. She didn't. She didn't like Berlioz. Oh, uh, not why, as a person. Why didn't she, she, like didn't, she didn't like his music. Um, uh, I think she just. What was it about the music? 
Oh yeah, there, there was um, a Verdi, like some, some things she just didn't, she wasn't so nice about. So like a Verdi opera she said was, was heavy and tedious and stupid and uninteresting. Um, oh no, which one was it? <laughs> it was The Masked Ball, so beware. Ah. Um, and Berlioz, she said, I can't remember what piece it was, but it was, she likened it to listening to cats and dogs. <laughs> so very brutal. <laughs> oh no. But I think, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What were some of the things that she said about Clara Schumann? Do you have the excerpts? I'm curious. I do. I do. So she met Clara Schumann at least twice, I'm aware of, in her diaries. Um, she's spoken about like music that she's played of, of Robert Schumann, which she is, you know, like a fan of, but not specifically like particularly obsessed with. But he, she's aware of him, um, and she's uh, Schum um, Clara Schumann came to play on the 21st of April, 1856. Uh, and Victoria said of her that mm. uh, Madame Schumann plays quite beautifully. And at the end of the concert, I asked her to play two more pieces. She is the wife of the celebrated composer who has gone out of his mind. And she has come over here to get engagements in order to support her family. It is very touching to see her grief and the look of sorrow on her face. Uh, yeah, because when you set the date, Robert Schumann died a few months after, I think. Oh. Let me quickly look this up because 56, right? Yeah, it's April, April 1856, yeah. He died, he died July 29th, 1856. Oh. So when you said it, I already had a particular um, impression of how that might have looked because, yeah, that was a really, really tough time for, yeah, tough time is just such a <laughs> meaningless <laughs> description, yeah, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, kind of so that time. was the first time yeah it, it doesn't really uh do the experience justice but um that was her first time to queen victoria yeah and the second time was in 18 1872 she doesn't she just says she, uh clara schumann came over and plays two pieces on the piano beautifully so it wasn't so much a description of like meeting her or talking to her it was just that she, that she came mm. over to play piano and i'm i'm not i don't know much about uh, Clara Schumann's time in in England. I don't know if you can offer any anything there. But... No, unfortunately, no. no, because I my main focus has been more on Robert Schumann's uh, commentaries about music, because yeah. he wrote. Uh, he was the editor of a journal, a music journal, and he had a lot of thoughts about people like Berlioz, for example. I recent actually that's the chapter I'm on right now. That's um. He commented on the brilliance of Brelios and he was saying, oh, he uh, epitomizes certain qualities that he looks for in a musical work, but people don't understand it. And uh, I think his praise of Brelios kind of helped his reputation a lot uh, because there were people who really thought that it was probably way too avant-garde and sounded like cats and dogs because there was not a very uh, classical structure or the sounding and the instrumentation. It was all very wild. And uh, I think, yeah, so it's interesting to hear the different <laughs> sides of the Berlioz's uh, music. And the yeah, reception. I mean, it's definitely worth saying that, that Victoria was as much she loved music and amateur like me. So I feel like she was never going to have that, that same, like, understanding of Berlioz but well I mean Berlioz. everyone everyone can have uh, their own taste and I don't think it really matters whether you're an amateur or not an amateur so much I mean yes to some extent but I also think um, it's all about what we're used to at the time and Berlioz was really uh, mm. you hear about him in music history classes all the time because he really set a new way of composing and uh, so yeah so it was just really new and weird <laughs> when they first encountered it so what are some other composers that you would like to highlight for us I'm really um, curious these kinds of exchanges yeah or uh, comments there are, <laughs> there are many many good ones uh, I will definitely send like the actual Russian stuff later um uh, um, hmm. I mean, there was. Oh, there are so many. I don't know. Um, I will. I will say more about Mendelssohn if I if I can. Um, sure, of course. Because that was definitely one. Schumann loved Mendelssohn too. So, yeah. <laughs> Not to say that everything should be uh, talked about just because of Schumann, but uh, at the time valid, he was a, a really prominent. <laughs> 
But uh, no, but also I think it's more than that. He was a really prominent and uh, active figure uh, around that time in music and really did a lot, not only to revive box music, but also just in general organizing all sorts of concerts to um, promote different composers' music. And um, yeah, he was a very prominent figure and very important one. So I'm curious what she thought. Yeah, so um, the first time that they met was in June 1842. Um, where she sort of, uh, she just, yeah, she's, she's queen at this point. Uh, she's married and Albert, her husband introduces Mendelssohn to her as they, uh, they knew each other. Um, and he came to play piano for them and, um, Victoria is kind of like enthralled and just, yeah, pretty much amazed. Um, and she writes, um, that he asked, he asked them to give him a theme upon which he could improvise. Um, we chose um, two and gave him Rule Britannia and the Austrian National Anthem. He began immediately, and really I have never heard anything so beautiful. The way in which he blended them together and changed over from one to another was quite wonderful, as well as the exquisite harmony and feeling he puts into the variations and the powerful rich chords and modulations, which reminded me of um, one of all his beautiful compositions. Um, and then the, the good thing about these exchanges, actually, is that you get Victoria's entries and then you equally get Mendelssohn's take on what happened because he wrote letters home to his brother and mother. Um, oh. Yeah. So <laughs> were there discrepancies? I mean, the, the story is pretty much the same, but the, the thoughts are very different. So of that, Mendelssohn said... Um, uh, <laughs> essentially at the end of it he was obliged to, to collect his thoughts in order not to lose all self-possession so I think he was probably a bit overwhelmed <laughs> hmm. yeah and then that's the second a, that's very interesting <laughs> yeah it, it's good um the second time um well it's, I don't know if it's the second time they met but definitely like the second major um thing that comes up in both Mendelssohn and Victoria's respective letters and correspondences and diaries um, is when he said he came to say goodbye to Victoria and Albert um, in July 1842. Um, Victoria kind of just just kind of mentions it in a fairly short entry where she says that he came um, and she sang for him and she says that she was you know she was nervous and Mendelssohn's um, Mendelssohn's letter home to his mother was just like as you can imagine, I mean, you just got the Queen of England to sing one of your own songs to you. So he was really, like, really flattered. Um, uh, and Victoria gave him a ring that was inscribed with her initials in the year. Um, and he critiques Victoria's singing. So he says, um, where it goes down to the D and then comes up again in semitones, she sang D sharp each time. And then she sang D where it ought to have been D sharp. Uh, but then, you know, he's quite complimentary. Um, and eventually, I mean, the song that Victoria sang initially actually was written by Fanny Mendelssohn, his sister. Uh, oh. And v Mendelssohn very sort of begrudgingly claims like, oh, I didn't write that one. That was my sister. Would you mind singing another one that I wrote? <laughs> so she oh, did. yeah, actually, I remember this because uh, our social media team, Laura and our team, made an Instagram reel about this. Uh, I remember this fact about Fanny Mendelssohn, and I thought that was very interesting. But yeah. when you mentioned that Mendelssohn was very picky about the uh, intonations or landing a D or a D sharp, it actually makes a lot of sense to me because to me, when if I were to read that um, entry, I would interpret it as a an example of his preciseness is that a word precision Precise. i guess yeah precision that's the word precision, precision. precisiveness that's not a word <laughs> precision because that's how i always feel when i play his music it's all very uh particular it's either all staccatos or all 16 notes or it's everything very um formulaic and very precise so actually it makes sense that he would um pick up out the intonations yeah. and <laughs> things not landing exactly on the right note <laughs> yeah i mean he, he wasn't he wasn't afraid to tell victoria she messed up he was like he, he like played the note on the piano so she could get it right <laughs> so yeah so they were good friends clearly, to me like that <laughs> yeah clearly very very keen on getting the right notes <laughs> ah okay yeah so 
I would not be able to play Mendelssohn very well if, uh, because I'm not a very exact player. Sometimes I don't land on the right notes, so I'm always like, I'm not a Mendelssohn player for that very reason. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, what other excerpts to which you like to share? Um, there's... <laughs> Oh yeah, I found the one about Berlioz. Um, yes, it's it's quite funny. She's, um, you know, she's how old is she in this? Twenty four, thirty four. Um, she's, you know, she's not a child anymore. She's got like, she's not complaining as she used to about like Handel and how she just doesn't have time for him. But she says, um, <laughs> uh, she says there was not a particle of melody, only disjointed and most confusing sounds producing a fearful noise that could only be compared to the noise of dogs and cats. Very brutal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it totally makes sense because for Berlioz, it wasn't about the songfulness of music. It was just uh, a lot of effects and this chord and dissonances and yeah so i understand <laughs> why she would describe it like that yeah and then there's um charles Cherney, who she was this mm. was when she was a child so victoria or, or a teenager i suppose um victoria was very very impressed with him because he you know he could improvise very well um so he t- he tells her that Sometimes he can compose a whole duet in one day, and she's like, "Wow, this is that's incredible!" And she was delighted. She says, "Very much delighted with his performance." Um, so that's another one. And then there's an, in her very late life, um, Grieg came over um, and played. Hmm. Uh, she says she admires his music so much, um, and describes him as elderly, very small, nice, simple, and very delicate health. It's actually quite nice to hear her describe how they like physically appear before her because you know obviously I mean with Greg and some of the later ones I suppose there are photographs but with others less so so it's kind of nice to hear hear how they how they appear if that makes sense yeah it makes them more human than just a con- concept in our brain and the words on a page yeah huh it makes sense so I mean Greeks I also would think that she would like his music because it's lyric pieces come to mind. Mm-hmm. Just uh, if if she didn't like Berlioz, then she would probably be looking for music that are that's a lot more lyrical and songful. So it makes sense, and it's very simple. I think Greek's music it's very pure. Yeah. Huh, uh, fascinating. Yeah. There's also Franz Liszt, which I mean, I'm uh, kind of jealous well, that you got to hear him. To be honest. <laughs> Was she fascinated by his uh, aura and spectacular? Uh, I would I say, yeah. So she <laughs> she says um, this was in 1886. So she says she hasn't seen him for 43 years, um, and wow. who from then having been um, a very wild, fantastic-looking man was now a quiet, benevolent-looking old priest with long white hair and scarcely any teeth. That's but interesting. He, yeah, he, yeah. So she is very, she's very impressed by him, like his his ability to play piano as he did. But yeah, again, it's just commenting on her <laughs> on the physical appearance, which I I wouldn't have thought of. Pretty much, it's very interesting. Well, in the very beginning of our chat, you mentioned her descriptions when she was younger as a teenager, and a lot of it was about the appearance and the uh, way the opera singers looked, and so. I guess it makes sense that she would also describe their appearances a lot here, um, even when she gets older. So yeah. I guess maybe that uh, that actually relates to a lot of your project, right? Because you're trying to understand how she um, curates her public image. Yeah, that that is true. I mean, I I like the idea that um, as a child she used to dress up as all children do but i i do like the kind of idea that she, that's essentially what she felt like she she was doing for the rest of her life um as, <laughs> as a queen which i i don't know if that is entirely accurate to say but it's definitely an interesting way to consider it hmm. 
Well, it definitely, as you say, gives her a lot more dimensions, and it's not just a what you see on a portrait, and it's a lot more human emotions that we can kind of relate to. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I can't wait to. If you decide to update me with how things are going with your research, I'm curious what um, more things you would discover through this uh, dive into her letters and what she says about music and how that could possibly play a part in your research and your conclusions about her. Yeah, def- I'll definitely keep you updated. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious. So anything else you'd uh, like to tell our audience on Classical Chat? Oh. No, only just only just a thank you for having me, really. Oh, well, it's been fun to hear you read the entries, and uh, I hope people enjoyed hearing kind of the musical life back then, even for uh, people in the political sphere. There's a lot of crossing over, and um, yeah, it's been interesting to hear. And good luck with your, with your um, playing of Beethoven. What else are you working on? Oh, um... Uh, one of Bach's inventions, but I haven't really paid much attention to that recently. I should probably get back on that. I wonder if you get influenced actually by what Queen Victoria says in her diaries about music, if you decide to pick up any pieces or pieces from composers that she liked. I mean, probably because she's so, so obsessed with the romantic composers. She doesn't really have time for anything else. And I, I've noticed that increasingly all I've been playing are romantic composers. So... <laughs> Maybe, there you go. Maybe it is. Yeah, she barely she barely mentions Bach at all, actually. But I suppose he wasn't such a he wasn't as revered as he is today. Kind well, of... I'm not sure what pieces they played back then because Clara Schumann played all sorts of repertoire, and um, Mendelssohn was really into reviving the old masters, and that of course included Bach. So I'm not sure. Maybe she really um, was focused on the Romantics and the contemporaries of her time. Yeah. So. Hmm. It's funny well, to think about her as contemporaries of the time. Yeah, because I think a lot of times we think of composers as one group, and we don't really think about the other parts of their life and who they might have um, interacted with. Someone like Queen Victoria, I didn't really think so much about it. And I actually, even though I have heard of Mendelssohn's uh, Scottish Symphony, I didn't know that he dedicated it to her. So learning a little bit of information every day. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you so much for coming on to Classical Chats. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much for listening. This is the end of this Classical Chats. I'm really excited about the season so far because we've had really diverse people from all walks of life and we're all together because of classical music and so this is my favorite thing and I hope you enjoy Classical Chats and be sure to check out other episodes for more stories about classical music and different experiences.